Hello, Marketing Myths and Magic Group. We are live with Brian Williams, and he is the owner of Northshire Consulting here in Connecticut and a financial advisor to small businesses and families. And one of the things I love about what Brian does, um, and you can hear more about this on his podcast episode, is that he helps small businesses with the things that the state mandates for uh, what they have to do for their employees, for like retirement plans and such. And he helps guide them on the changes and he helps uh, suggest different ways of doing things affordably. And just, you know, I just, I'm really impressed with Brian, how you kind of go the extra mile for them and you care more about, you know, getting them the right plan than making some big commission. And you also consult with people outside your area so that they can then go find their own plans with their own local person. So you're yep. giving a service to people outside your area as well as in. So tell me, you know, what you're doing with that and, uh, you know, what people are looking for with that and what we'll ask some questions. And as uh, people join us, we'll, we'll ask for questions. Otherwise, you know, we'll just have a chat. And uh, if nobody is extroverted enough to ask questions, I'm going to ask them. So. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm just uh, sorry, I'm adjusting my camera a little bit here. Is, okay. uh, yeah, it went a little bit haywire as we were coming on here. But um, yeah, I said you were kind of green around the edges there. I thought maybe you're just really envious of my cool zoom yes. background. Yeah, definitely. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you said a lot of stuff there and hopefully I can, I can touch hopefully on it. Was all of accurate. It, Please let me know if I said that accurately. <laughs> no, it was, it was, I mean, uh, sort of at the forefront are those state mandates. So uh, Connecticut is following the lead of some other states like California and Illinois where, um, so specifically in Connecticut, about 40% of the workforce, which is about a million and a half people don't have access to save anything through work if they wanted to. And we know that um, social security probably won't be enough for most folks. And um, the days of, you know, working 40 years for the telephone company and getting a pension, those days are kind of over too. So people are going to have to draw on their own savings in retirement. And, and we're certainly at a place now with longevity where it's very real possibility that people will be retired almost as long as they worked. You know, if you work from 25 to 65, that's 40 years. And if you live to 105, that's another 40 years. So, you know, you have to figure out where that income is coming from. And I give the state some credit there for at least recognizing this and saying, how can we push business owners to, to do something for their employees? So, so the mandates are you either have to have an outside retirement plan, like a 401k plan for your employees, or you have to be part of the state program. Uh, I think where the state falls a little bit short is it's taken them so long to get these programs up and running. They're always, you know, like a year or two behind as you'd expect states to be. So, so they're putting out a program and trying to fix a solution that was maybe a problem four or five years ago. Um, there's been so much acceleration in the quality of retirement plans from technology and competitive forces where, you know, if you've got a five person bakery, you can spin up a 401k plan relatively quickly and get it up and running. So there isn't as much a need for a state program as, as there was, you know, in Connecticut when they originally passed the, uh, the law in 2016, uh, even though it was only five or six years ago, a lot's changed in the retirement industry. So yeah. give the state's credit for addressing the issue. Um, and we'll see if their solution makes sense or not. Well, bureaucratic wheels turn very mm -hmm. slowly. We know this. Yep. Um, you, you can't just ask for something and have it boom right in front of you. It's got a lot of go, got to go through a lot of committees, got to go through a lot of paperwork. And it's also got to match anything that came down from the feds, which you know, might not be the case here, but a lot of that is also in play, right? So yep. that's the stuff that I have a lot of trouble weeding through in the time available to me as a small business owner. So I think it's great that you have that service and, you know, it's someone you can go talk to that you can trust to give you the right advice, not just what's, you know, beneficial for you. And uh, that's one of the things I really like about, about how you present things. Um, so you know, if, if I have a team that's got, you know, two or three people, like what's the, what's the cutoff where I have to do a retirement now? Do you have to do it if you have one employee or do you have to offer it only if you have a certain level down? Yeah, good, 
Good question. Most of the states are cutting off at five employees, and that's the way it looks like Connecticut's going to be structured. Uh, Oregon, I think, has gone all the way down to your first employee. So as soon as you hire someone other than yourself, you have to have a retirement plan. But it looks like now the cutoff is going to be five employees. Uh, right now, Connecticut's in their beta testing or their pilot program. So they've accepted a few employers in, um, and they're just kind of working on the back end to make sure that's up and running. So we don't have a lot of the details yet here specifically, but looking at, at the way California and Oregon have, have sort of structured theirs, normally they start with, you know, 100 or more employees, you got to have a plan, and then they go down to 50 and 25, and and then they start finding you. And that's where yeah. that's uh. where California has uh, has started to find some some people and send out notices. So, you know, and their their goal is not to find people. They'd much rather you comply and have a plan for your employees. But ultimately, there has to be some sort of enforcement on the other end, or it doesn't have much teeth. So, um, right. So that's right. the way they've been putting them together. Yeah, and depending on the state, there's some states that are going to lean much more towards you know do it now or do it as part of our program and, and other states that don't, you know, format things quite that way, structure things quite that way. But it's good to be able to do it just as a as a competitive measure to be able to say, you know, we have one, we have one that's not just the state program and we looked into the right thing. You know, what's the benefit? <clears throat> like, okay, so my team is not over five people in-house yet. I use a lot of uh, freelancers. So if I have if I have three or four, when should I start thinking about getting that plan kind of on paper to at least take the first steps? Do I, can I wait till I have that fifth employee if it becomes five or can I, or should I be ready when that fifth person on board? Yeah. I mean, you can obviously start a plan at any time. I mean, even uh, solopreneurs can start those solo 401ks. So um, you can start one at any time. So if you think it could help with recruiting or retention, um, you know, it might be something you want to start with three or four employees. Um, if it's something you think you're going to be growing quickly and you don't want to worry about it later on, I mean, ultimately we want business owners to be doing them for the right reasons, right? So I'd rather work with business owners who are doing it because they want to help their employees. They realize that this is a benefit to, to everybody involved, not just because they have to do it because it's a state mandate. So, um, you know, at any point in the, you know, life cycle of the, employer, they, they can start a plan. So it's really when you better to do it now while you have some time than when you've onboarded extra people. And now you've got to look at this too. And right. uh, again, you don't want to necessarily just dump it into the state program, but that state program might be right for some companies too. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. yeah. If you've got maybe a lot of turnover or a lot of part-time or younger employees, um, you know, the state program, it's, it's an IRA program. So it had that's limits as far as how much you can put away are a lot less than the 401k. It's only a, a Roth solution. So there's no ability to put any money away pre-tax. So, so there are some intricacies that make it not ideal for a lot of employees. Um, but it's certainly better than nothing. And, um, you know, you want to, you want to make sure that you're projecting yourself as a business owner, you know, not that employees are really locked into this yet, but at some point they're going to look at this and, and if they're looking at job A and job B and job A is in the state mandate and in, in doing the bare minimum for their employees and, and plan B is, you know, an employer who's taking a little bit more pride in what they're offering their employees and being a little more proactive and, it, you know, it does reflect on your ability to recruit and retain quality talent for sure. I, I agree. I think it really is going to make a big difference down the line, better to be prepared. And I personally am uh, team centric in the way that I manage in that the people who are in front of me answering the phones or answering the emails, you know, whether it be an assistant or a salesperson or a marketing assistant, anyone who's working with my clients, the team is my customer and then they'll treat my customer better. And, you know, not everybody has that, that outlook um, but that's how it works for me. And I think that a lot of younger entrepreneurs see it that way. They were raised to think of things as a team and to think of uh, working together. So having that option of, you know, giving them the best is certainly a, something I think is going to be attractive to, you know, the millennials who are, you know, going into their forties. Now they're, they're, they're owning businesses. They may have owned businesses for a while now. So that's a really good point. Um, 
that actually brings up a question that I see all the time that I, I always ask. And um, I don't know this as well as I'd like to, and I'm not asking you to give me all the intricacies in 15 minutes, but the difference between a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA and a 401k for someone who's a solopreneur or, yes. you know, an entrepreneur who's trying to just set up their own retirement account. What's the best thing? You know, I have an IRA that I dump money into every year to make sure that I take that off my taxes. But, you know, then I hear, well, you should have a Roth IRA if you're self-employed or you should have this if you're self-employed. Should I have all of them? I don't know. Like, what's the best way as a general overview? Not a whole concept yeah. right now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, generally, um, you know, if you're so if you're talking about the difference between Roth and traditional on the IRA side, usually the rule of thumb is for younger people who are maybe not making a lot of money, they're going to go to the Roth side because the money is going to grow tax free. So if you're doing that at age 25, and you can let it grow tax free for 40 years, that's potentially a pretty powerful tool. And also, you don't need that tax deduction um, that to be able to defer that tax right away, because you're not making as much as you might be when you're age 55. So that's generally the rule is younger, they're going to skew a little bit more towards the Roth side. Um, but it really depends on, you know, household income and age and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, on the 401k side, you have that split too. So you can have a Roth 401k and a more traditional 401k. And some people split their money. Um, you can you can do that too, of course. Um, one thing that's important too to remember is anything that the company puts in as far as a company match always goes to the traditional side. So a lot of people say, well, I put in 3%, company puts in three, the company has to go on the traditional side. So that's going to grow tax deferred. I'm going to put my 3% in on the Roth side and kind of grow those different buckets because we don't know what taxes are going to look like in 40 years or even four years. But what we do know is that it'll be better to have options. So you want to have those different buckets to pull from and those different levers to pull based on pulling that money out in retirement. So um, that makes so your... much sense. That was just like so simple. Thank you for explaining yes. the way that I can understand <laughs> Notice he didn't put any numbers in that for me. Thank you. So yes. except, <laughs> except the, the ages, 401k. But, yeah. <laughs> but those those you can track. Yeah. The ages in the 401 part. So yeah, yes. no, I didn't realize that 401s can be split. And mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, because yeah, if you have a match and you're able to put in as much as they're gonna match so that you get the most benefit, but you can invest somewhere differently with that three percent, mm -hmm. it's a lot of people probably don't look at that. And that's a really good point. Right. Really right. good point. I never yeah. did when I had a 401k. You know, I've learned a lot you know the, since then though. We talk about, uh, you and I have talked different about generation and, and things like that, but the uh, the generation coming out and those, the younger folks, they're, they're more locked into this, I think, than employers realize. So, you know, you may not choose job A over job B because they have a Roth 401k, but employees are looking at this stuff and they, yeah. they recognize employers who are doing the right thing for their employees and they're, um, you know, they're really good savers. They are probably more so than any other generation, you know, those, especially those age 25 to, to 35. I mean, they're, um, they're pretty financially savvy, I think more so than employers give them credit for. So employers looking at hiring these people need to be a little more locked into that. That's fascinating because mm -hmm. you also hear about all the student loan debt and how, mm -hmm. you know, crushed they are by this monthly debt that they can't get rid of, but um, it, it, well, except for right now during COVID when everything's deferred, which, you know, the smart thing to do would be to keep paying on it, but you know, a lot of people are not, and it's tempting not to when that's a crushing debt, um, sure. at least there's no interest, but yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And I, I wonder if there's correlation there. So why do you think that if you know, why do you think the younger generations then, you know, say me, who's been in the the career world for 20 years, why do you think they're better savers? Is it because they grew up during a recession? And, well, you know, I grew up in the eighties and Gordon geckos of the world. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. Greed is good. Right. No, I, think, right. I, I mean, I really think it's just as simple as it's, it's just more information. I mean, every generation is taller or stronger, smarter. I mean, it's, that's just the way it is. I mean, I, and I, you know, we, a lot of the old timers will, you know, poke fun at the kids and things like that. And back in my day and whatever, but there's no denying that every generation is just, I think a little, but a little better than the one before it. I think it's really that, that simple, the amount of 
information that that's available to, to people. They're just naturally going to absorb more because they've lived through this whole information age um, where everything is available on voice command. I mean, and that's such a powerful, powerful tool. I mean, I don't know if you've, I forgot what it, I read once that it was, you know, at the, the turn of the century from the 1800s to 1900s, the, you know, the average person knew less than was in one, one daily edition of the New York Times. Like, if you think about that, I mean, it's the amount of information that's out there, you're just naturally going to absorb more of it. So oh, just um, the speed think, of it. Yeah. Just the yeah, speed of I think information. It's really that simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if somebody sneezes in, you know, Southern India, we know three seconds later. So, sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. So if, um, if somebody wants to, you know, set something like this up and talk to you, what are the first steps? Like, where do you start them? What kind of questions do you ask them or that they need to ask themselves about what, what they need to do? Yeah. Well, one of the first questions I ask, and, and I learn a lot right from this question is uh, if a business owner reaches out to me, I'll say, okay, who is this plan for? Is this for you or your employees? And I ask them to be honest and, and, and it's okay either way. There is no wrong answer, but a lot of times it's somebody who's, you know, maybe 50 years old and they say, well, I only have two employees and they're young and I need to do this plan for myself to make sure that I can put away as much as I can. And, you know, I know my younger employees will probably turn over and not stay here long. And, you know, I want to help them out, but really this plan is for me and, you know, my spouse and whatever, and that's okay. But that'll lead me down a path of structuring the program a certain way. Um, other times it, the em employer will say, you know what, I'm really not taking any money out of the business right now. I'm really not making any money, um, relying maybe on a spouse's income or savings. So I'm really doing this to recruit and retain the employees that I have. And that might lead me down a, a different path. So that's one of the first questions that I ask is who, who is this a benefit for you or your employees? And that'll open up another line of questioning, which will make things a lot easier. Um, and most people are usually pretty fair about answering that. Um, so that's really helpful. And then from there, it's, you know, I ask them about their different type of experiences they've had and how they prefer to work with other professionals is a, is a really interesting question to ask if they say, well, I pay my, my accountant a monthly fee and I, I sit with them every month and we go over everything and we handle it in really small, um, you know, doses so that I can take it all in then that'll tell me that that might be the relationship they want to structure with me, almost more like a subscription based and, and something like that, where it's really just more of a, an ongoing kind of relationship. If they say, well, I just walk in and I, you know, drop, drop a pile of documents on my accountant's table once a year. Well, then that might tell me a little bit more about how they work with, with individuals. So um, just getting the idea of what type of professionals they already work with and how they're, they've structured those relationships will help me a lot. And then from there, you get into the nitty gritty, but that's really, I just ask for an employee census, which is basically, you know, everybody's aid, you know, date of birth, their name, their address, how much money they made. And then from there, I can, you know, kind of figure out what the best program is. But um, th that's usually how I lead into these conversations. I mean, that kind of expertise is what we don't, what we don't know. And um, that's, you know, the path they don't know how to take the first steps on. Or they think, mm -hmm. well, it'll be easy if I just sign up for something. And then they go in and look at themselves and say, oh, this is way more complicated than I thought. Or they pick the wrong thing. That's, you know, you don't want that. Um, right. At least those are things I could see having happen. Yep. Um, and we know that the easy is not always right, but the easy is very tempting sometimes, right? Especially for a business owner know. who's busy running a business. They might be yeah. out on the sales floor or at the counter or at their desk, um, not just not just doing the, uh, you know, the back end of the business. So mm -hmm. you make a good point. It's easy is, is too quick for people sometimes when they feel, you know, like a time crunch. Right. right. So and like uh, everything else, it changes so quickly. So somebody could say, well, I started my business and then, you know, I had a, I was in an HR department or worked at a big company 10 years ago. So I know the way 401ks work or something like that. And, you know, like so many other industries, it's like, if you're three years removed from an industry, it's probably totally different than when you left. Yeah. You know, they, they say that about, you know, like NFL coaches or professional sports. Like if you stop coaching and you're out of the league for three years, you know, you basically start from scratch, you know, because there's yeah. just so much turnover and so much change. That's true of marketing too. I have, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people come to me say, I used to do a lot of marketing and I thought I could do it myself again. And I, it's, 
beyond me, the technology, the tools, you know, we're continually educating ourselves on the new things. And the same thing goes for financial advisors. And you want them to, I think I use this. I don't remember if I used this on your podcast or someone else's, but I use the example of my father is a, he's a retired commercial airline pilot. And he spent tons of time training every year on the newest upgrades in technology in the cockpit. And do you want a pilot who's not continuing his education? Right. Do you want yeah. him to not go away for training every few years and go in that flight right. simulator again? No. And you want, that's true of everybody. We're flying your marketing plane. We're flying your financial plane and mm -hmm. we need to always be up on it. So that's where the expertise comes in. Um, sure. So there you go, dad. I learned something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that um, I think that's all very good points. And you also can consult with people who are trying to do this outside of the states you you work in. So if I'm calling you from Oregon and I want to know, you know, how to set this up, you can offer that too. Yeah, we just finished a, a, some consulting work we did with a nonprofit in Ohio who. It kind of had a, a sticky situation that we were looking to clear that up going backwards and then going forward, help them establish a plan. So I was kind of that bridge where it was cleaning up the old stuff, but then also helping them find a, a local advisor who could service them going forward. Obviously, everything with, you know, doing virtual meetings and stuff like that, it's we're all kind of on a borderless, locationless world. But um, but I think still it makes sense for organizations like they wanted a very high touch service and somebody to come in and meet with all their employees all the time. So I told them early on, I was not a good fit for that. And it was better for me to, um, everybody they had reached out to, to kind of solve this problem had said, don't worry about the past. That's not a big deal. Here's what I can sell you going forward. And nobody had really approached them with the idea that let's solve the other problem and let's get you set up with somebody else. And so nobody was really solving that immediate need for them, which is what they were looking for. They were always pushing away the past and, and trying to sell them something going product. So I kind of sat on their side of the table, as you would say, reached out to some local advisors there and had them submit their RFPs and things like that and guided them through what to look for in an advisor, which is, a, I think, kind of an underrated capacity in this in this business to do kind of that one time parachute in take a look at it and and move on type of things even on the individual side we're starting to do a little bit more of that where somebody says you know what i like my advisor but you know maybe it was my parents advisor or this advisor i've had for a long time or i've kind of been punted around the office from you know three or four i just need you to come in and take a look at it once am i doing the right things what would you do differently you know, and then I can just give them kind of an objective one page report of here's what's happening. Here's the questions to ask. And then I'm out, you know, and they know that I am just operating in their best interest because I'm not looking for any sort of ongoing relationship. I had somebody refer to this exact kind of scenario yesterday. Um, and, and, you know, here's here's the sports metaphor. This will this will end my knowledge of sports metaphors. <laughs> but, you know, they called it quarterbacking, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you're you're you know, we're not asking you to give up what you're using for this service, but we will help you with this other service and then make sure it works all together. And um, I thought that was a really good, really good way of describing it because even I understand what a quarterback does. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it gives you a quarterback, right? Is that how that works? Yeah. No, yeah. that's not how that works. So um, I think that, uh, I think that's, you know, a really, really great service to be able to give somebody. And I, I love the way you described it because you're saying, listen, I wasn't going to come in and fly into Ohio to see you every quarter to go over this or every year. That's not you. That's not your business. There might be people who do that, but that's not you. And um, besides, all you need is one more moment of pandemic and there'll be no airplanes anyway for you to ride. Yeah. Once your dad <laughs> I'll be shut a down on a flight. Right. Yeah. So um, that's, that's a really great service. And then you know that that person is invested for you, not for themselves, because you're helping them find someone else to replace you. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty big. So mm -hmm. that's, you're going to be pretty honest about that, unless it's your cousin right. in Ohio, but I don't think it was. So. Right. <laughs> no. Nobody cousins in Ohio. Okay. No. So. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But Maybe, but nothing that you want. Probably. Nobody that does what you do. No. So um, we're, we're coming up at the end of our half hour and I really appreciate Already? these wow. questions. I know that was quick, right? Um, oh, is, yeah. so I've been looking at the clock cause I'm like, I'll forget it's going very fast. 
So <laughs> yeah, um, I love the questions and I love the answers that we talked about today. And this is, you know, we're going to put this up on our, our YouTubes so we can have other people ask questions and um, tell people how they can find your YouTube because you have a lot of good instructional videos up there that where you explain just like this other yeah. topics. Yeah, we, uh, you know, the name of it, my business is Northshire Consulting. So we're northshireconsulting.com and we have the Facebook group, um, which is called 401k and beyond. And that's also our, we've sort of adopted that. Yeah, I named that my Facebook group that just to be a little bit more identifiable when people searched it. And it, uh, it, it ended up sort of morphing into, yeah, that's exactly what this. Well, we talk 401ks, but then there's so much that goes on around the outside of that. So, so I've sort of taken that and adop adopted that as my online persona or handle or whatever you want to use there. So, so we do some Instagram stuff. We do some, some, even some TikTok. We started over the last week or so, but um, we have a decent library of a couple hundred videos on the YouTube channel, um, about 1200 subscribers there. So we do everything from, you know, over the last week, I've done a last couple of weeks of video on, you know, how to, what to do in your 401k in a volatile market, um, you know, what or what not to do. Um, we've done some stuff even on, even on Bitcoin, which is not my area of expertise, but it's one of those things where it's like, all right, I went through, you know, all the process to research it and get up to speed. Well, now it's my job to deliver that out to the people so they can understand it. So um, all that kind of stuff, the mutual fund reviews, how to set up a 401k plan. So that's all 401k and beyond. Um, and that's where to find me. That's very cool. And, you know, thank you for being on the Marketing Myths and Magic podcast group on Facebook and LinkedIn today. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure we'll see you again. And um, I'll talk to you because I talked to you already in some of our, our groups, right? So I'll see yeah, you next right. week anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, I just, we just uh, started a podcast too. I forgot to mention that, uh, but um, a buddy in my, of mine had started, uh, he's actually a pilot, believe it or not. Um, but we started this, he's in the technology space and I'm in the finance space, but he's kind of got an interest in finance and a lot of the stuff that I do is very tech heavy. So we did this finance and technology podcast we figured we'd get about 10 episodes in before we really started to promote it and we've we've done about eight so we're starting to put that out there a little bit so that's finance and, and technology with with brian and eric so we have a, a facebook group for that and um you know we're about eight episodes in so we're having some fun with that kind of learning on the fly as we go just kind of making it up but uh we're yeah, excited i'm still about doing that, that. i'm in season two i'm just making right. it up on my podcast yeah it <laughs> never stops right <laughs> Because once you get to a certain point, then you want to get to the next level. So you're, yes. you're never going to, you're never going to level off. You know, you think you got the perfect setup and then you want to upgrade your camera. You want to upgrade your mic and, you know, you're, so you're always getting better and, you know, you're hoping you take three, four steps forward and one back. And that's, that's the way we all go at it now. Learning Absolutely. on the fly, right? Learning on the fly, continuing ed. It's a constant mm -hmm. thing in industry. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for being here. And uh, we will, we will see you soon. All right. Have a Sounds great good. Day. Thanks. Bye.